Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to say I kind of vividly remember uh, Mark miking me up from my first talk in 2015. So it's really awesome to come full circle and be able to join the join the society now uh, officially. Uh, I'm going to blaze through a 45 minute talk in 20 minutes. Uh, and so hopefully there'll be room for you guys to come and pull me aside after and, and have more deep in-depth discussion. But uh, so I want to talk to you about a, a, an ongoing project that I have. And this is a collaboration with uh, Helene and Cedric from IONS and Julia Mossbridge from the Institute of Love and Time, and um, as well as my academic mentor um, at, uh, at my old university. So um, what we're doing is essentially we are creating an image norming project. And what that means is that we are gathering uh, and curating thousands of images um, that are gathered from various sources. Uh, with those images, we are classifying them into 18 meaningful categories. Uh, and for each image in the database, then we're collecting ratings across these 18 separate categories. Uh, and in so doing, we're trying to create like a normative distribution of ratings. Um, and uh, the purpose of this then is to create a, essentially a curated database of images that can be used for both traditional psychological research as well as parapsychological and in particular remote viewing, Gansfeld types of studies, et cetera, okay? Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about these normative ratings, but you can imagine that all of the users' ratings are forming some kind of distributions where you have mean, standard deviation, et cetera, for each class across each image. And I'll, I'll talk more about what, what I mean by class in, in a few minutes. So. Uh, so these classes were informed by previous psychological research as well as uh, you know, input from you know, uh, work that was previously done by Ed May, Stanley Krippner, Stephen Schwartz, and others. So each of these classes we then divide into three separate orders. And any given participant on the study will see one of these three orders. So they'll receive six questions uh, for each image that they see, if that makes sense. So uh, then basically participants, depending on the, if they're volunteering or if we're paying them through like Amazon Turk, they're going to either see 20 or 80 images. So for those 20 or 80 images, they're going to see six questions for each of those images and offer a rating. Um, and so each question then is paired with a high and low anchor point, which I'll, I'll give you an example of here in just a moment. Yeah, so this is what a typical question will be like. So one of our classes is animacy, and the question is how alive does the scene or situation depicted in this image feel? Images with a high rating depict scenes that give a sense of a life force behind them. By contrast, images with a low rating depict scenes that feel primarily inanimate. And so they have these anchor points, and they can move the slider to, to kind of endorse the question one way or another. So for this exact image, then, they'll see five additional questions. So here are the image classes. And unfortunately, I can't unpack each of these, but I'm happy to, to take an aside with anyone here. So for order one, they'll get questions about the embodiment of the image, the emotionality of the image, uh, whether it depicts movement, uh, whether it has, uh, what's the visual perspective? Is it more first or third person perspective? Uh, does it evoke more of an abstract or concrete uh, mental construal? Uh, does it evoke the saw, a sense of awe or wonder? The second order is whether it's sensory. So does it in encourage you to think about the image in terms of your five physical senses? Uh, psychological dis or uh, physical distance, excuse me. Uh, so how far away does the primary object in the image feel in terms of visual space? Uh, does it depict social imagery? So it could be people, but you could also think of social objects like telephones versus like rocks, for example, might be rated as more social. Uh, visual complexity, so how dynamic is the scene? Uh, is it natural or more man-made? And numinosity, uh, which is too much to explain in one slide, but uh, a lot of people here might, might know uh, this dimension that's furthered by people like uh, Stefan Schwartz and others. Uh, finally, the third order would be the interestingness of the image, um, how conceptually complex it is. So does it evoke kind of like more uh, deeper concepts? Um, how likely does the image seem? So some of the images are more imaginal and some seem to be more literal. Uh, temporal distance, does the image uh, depict something that seems like it's removed in time, either forward or backward in time from where your present moment? Animacy, which is the one I just kind of went through. 
as well as the emotional valence. So one is the emotionality, whether it's emotional or not, you can think of that as almost like an ar arousal vector. Emotional valence is more of its positive or negative emotional. Okay, so what we're at right now, or what the envisioned final product then, is an open source resource for you as researchers to use, uh, containing around 3,000 images, and each of these would be searchable uh, based on image caption metadata. So you could search based on the content tags, et cetera. Um, also, ideally, some image embedding, so you could find semantically similar images based on like an exemplar image. Uh, metadata containing a low-level visual information like, you know, contrast, luminance, et cetera, as well as these raw ratings, which would be the mean ratings for each of these classes, as well as the distribution characteristics if you wanted to get that. So you have a lot of data to work with there. Um, I do want to give a, a nod to some of the inspiration for this work, and um, now that I've gone through the what, I'm going to go through the why. Um, so in the 2019 uh, SSE presentation, maybe some of you were here, you remember Dale Graff's talk. Uh, he uh, described a study in which um, the viewers, in this case they were dreamers, were tasked to describe a newspaper uh, a headline and photograph that would appear for seven days into the future. And so the viewers were to dream about a specific image they will see and then create sketches based on their dream content. And here's one example, the sketch on the left and the um, actual photograph on the right. I found this extraordinarily interesting, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll kind of unpack this, because obviously it's not necessarily a clear out-of-the-park home run, as Larissa might, <laughs> might know about, right? Uh, but there's a lot of really interesting things going on here. First of all, take a look at the negative space of the image, okay? There's a pretty clear um, form that's overlapped in these two. So you seem to be capturing some elements of the form. Uh, secondly, you, in both images, you have this outstretched arm present, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, finally, um, even like kind of the movement of the hand is kind of like almost a sense of movement. There's like almost more fingers than their actual fingers and how that kind of lines up a little bit with the fuzzy beard of the dog, as well as this like birdness and this kind of almost like peacocking position that the dog's being put in that kind of evokes that same kind of structure in a way. Uh, another image from, uh, from this study that I thought was really fascinating uh, is this one. So here uh, the, the viewer uh, was able to pick up on this scene of the ambulance. But take note here, they, they correctly, this is a clear hit, they correctly identified the scene of the accident. But note the perspective, right? They didn't draw the image, they drew the context, the scene. This is a third person perspective and yet you have a first person target, if that makes sense. So this is really fascinating to me. Why would that be? So plausible explanations, of course, when you have to think about the whole, uh, all of the factors of, of this task, where you have the trait level individual differences, uh, you know, the viewer's natural talents and their degree of formal training and state and trait characteristics of the viewers. You have the contextual factors, uh, mood, setting, et cetera. You have the situational factors, what protocol was used, what their instructions were, all this other stuff. Uh, um, and, but I'm really kind of focused on the targets themselves. And so this brought up several initial questions. Um, first of all, what stimulus properties might influence the qualities of remote perception? Uh, why do viewers sometimes perceive the target image and other times they perceive the broader context or situation that that image represents? And do certain targets perhaps encourage a meaning-focused versus an object-focused perspective on the scene? So all of these kind of converge. You have these person factors, the situational <coughs> factors, and the stimulus factors. Sorry, my slides were made on a Mac, and I'm showing on a PC. That's why everything, everything's overlapping. But uh, you can kind of think of this kind of interaction across all of these factors that are influencing the raters or the, the viewer's uh, ability to kind of pick up on the signal from the target, OK? And I'm focused primarily for this project on the target properties themselves. So uh, I want to take a, a little bit more from a uh, route from my formal academic training and talk about construal level theory. I just have a paper that's under review at a motion review on this topic. Um, and this is extremely influential to my thinking in this. So the, the, the crux of construal level theory is that people form different types of mental representations of objects and events depending on the situation 
the stimulus or mental frame. And you can think of representations as like varying on a gradient from more concrete here and now, idiosyncratic and direct experience to more abstract, generalized, conceptual, or mentally simulated. And psychological distance is a variable that kind of pushes that uh, tendency to represent uh, around. So psychological distance then is this subjective degree to which the stimulus or event feels removed in either physical space, time, uh, social distance, as well as the likelihood or actuality of, of the object or situation being represented. So more proximal psychological distance will tend to induce more concrete mental construals and vice versa. So the closer we represent an object in space or time, for example, we tend to use more idiosyncratic, specific, tangible representations. Um, so for example, the consideration of this very specific tree, not the archetype of tree, but this specific tree, its branches, its leaf structure, what kind of tree it is, et cetera, okay? And this, of course, is like kind of that embodied by that metaphor or that uh, idiom of seeing the forest for the trees. Right? Seeing the forest or taking the forest view, you're not thinking about the idiosyncratics of a specific tree. You're getting more of a macro perspective or the archetype of treeness, for example. Okay? So let's think of this in terms of images now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a, a series of images that I'm controlling for the contents, but we're going to represent it in different ways to show how you can push this around. So uh, this view of the Brooklyn Bridge is proximally close. Notice it takes, it encourages a first person embodied perspective as if you're walking on the bridge, okay? And you tend to have a more idiosyncratic representation. This is the Brooklyn Bridge, correct? Uh, yet from this uh, overview effect, uh, it's still the Brooklyn Bridge, but you're considering it from a distant uh, perspective, okay? It's a third person overview effect. Uh, and you can almost think of your almost uh, contextualizing it in a broader space or a meaning field, which we'll talk about later, right? So in this way, you might have a higher tendency to consider it as a bridge than the Brooklyn Bridge, if that makes sense, because of that distance, we've also enveloped it into a larger semantic space. Temporal distance is another one, right? So we have this more immediate recent image versus this temporally distant rendering which evokes other associations having to do with the history and past, right? So imagine this is uh, two targets in a viewing. You might have different types of associations you make to this target than you would this one, even though the contents are technically the same in a lot of respects. Hypotheticality. So we could have, again, this real literal rendering, but does that differ then when we think of a more representational view of it? Uh, an artistic or cartoon or hypothetical uh, version of a bridge. Again, I would argue these are more abstract. So increasing distance along any vector then should generally evoke more abstract mental space and controls. Um, and this is, uh, can be illustrated by a why versus how focus. So let's take a temporal distance view here and let's talk about this conference. So, when you were reading the, the, uh, the conference announcement and deciding whether or not to come, you'd try to maybe think about ideas of what it's like to sit in a conference and listen to interesting talks and the opportunity to reconnect with colleagues and friends and the social connections. And you might think about, oh, what kind of uh, venue is it? And this is cool building that we're going to be in. And all of these are factors into judging whether or not you should go, right? So this is kind of a why focus. But yet the day before the conference, you have to think about how are you going to rearrange your work schedule this week and what exactly are the items that you need to pack in your suitcase and do you have your toiletries with you, et cetera, and what map and route do you need to take from Indianapolis to get here, for example, right? So it's a very different level of representation. It's much more specific, tangible, concrete, uh, how focused instead of why focused. Uh, a final piece of inspiration I want to mention is the idea of meaning fields that uh, Amon's presented in the 2017 SSE conference, and I won't be able to do it justice here in the limited time that I have, but I do want to kind of think about the effects or branching webs of association that different uh, types of representation or different types of targets might lead to. So 
we can think of this Brooklyn Bridge uh, image as being under the broader envelope of a New York City meaning field. Okay, and so what are the likely or plausible semantic associations we might form from that? Well, this is semantically close to things like Times Square or taxi cabs or uh, the Statue of Liberty, right? But what if we uh, had a target that's more this archetypal bridge or this generic type of wooden bridge? It's still a bridge, and as a bridge, might this lead to uh, a, a distance that's closer to like, let's say, the, the London Bridge, for example? Or what about the Rainbow Bridge uh, at uh, Lake Powell, right? Or what about a metaphorical bridge or bridging connections or bridging of ideas, right? So there's a lot of a different, it's a different type of associative web or meaning field that it might be situated in, in terms of the viewer. I'm going to make a provocative statement here, and that is that there is no amount of information that can effectively encapsulate a meaning because there is no clear line of demarcation defining the boundaries of the meaning field. And if that may, I know that might not make sense, but think about how bits can construct a, a character, and the characters can construct a word, and now you've encapsulated that word in terms of a number of bits. So far, so good. But even the word, something simple like apple, has an infinite cascading loop of meaningful associations with it. There's no clear line where you can say, this is the cutoff point. right? And this is, this is troubling and also amazing at the same time. And I'll give an example. So from Larissa's talk, you might remember the, a compelling image that's very similar to this. And this was one of her early hits and probably stamped with a lot of saturated like awe from that first big home run, right? There's a lot of meaning, personal meaning. That meaning gets extended when she talks about it in this conference and it's in the minds of all of us that are like, you know, also equally awed by that. And then I pull up my Facebook feed and my uh, friend of mine had posted this as an image uh, in her feed synchronistically or coincidentally. Maybe it doesn't mean anything, right? But again, that, that's why it's so difficult to operationalize in an experiment something like remote viewing because the psi effect or whatever, the meaning of the experience cannot be contained or constrained so easily within the parameters of our design of our experiment. So it's both troubling experimentally but also amazing at the same time. So I'm going to rush through a couple more ideas here really quickly. Um, just some initial questions then. Why we're working on this project is we want to find, are there properties of images that we can use to essentially uh, look to as predictors for the probability of a hit or possibly the probability of a displacement effect? Um, and ultimately, we want to look at that intersection between the subconscious and conscious processes of the viewer and these uh, properties that are inherent within the targets themselves. And this, the current status is a quick update. So right now, we're about halfway there. We have 1,500 images rated. We have a minimum of 15 ratings for each of those 18 classes for all of those 1,500 images. Um, and then we just want to just really touch on the face validity. So, so far, as an update, do these ratings appear to line up with the constructs that we're purportedly better measuring? Is there good face uh, construct validity? So. <laughs> Uh, here's a couple of examples. So perspective, this is an image that was rated as uh, low, which means it has more of a first-person perspective. It hopefully is encouraging you to think about walking on that path. Um, this is a third-person perspective image that's rated high. You get that overview effect. So I think that looks pretty good. That's encouraging. Uh, numinosity, uh, you can read this offline. I'm not going to be able to go through it quickly, but uh, this machine uh, contraption here was rated low as numinosity. The cemetery, this old cemetery with the old gravestones, are rated high. I thought that was a good that was a good uh, exemplar. And visual complexity. So this is more of a simple rated image. It's not super dynamic in terms of visual space. This is a highly uh, visually complex image, right? So I think it, I think it's look the data is looking good so far. Is what I'm trying to say. Um, Applications. So again, I've already kind of mentioned we can use this for empirical tests. We can try to predict if any of these variables are predictive of hit or, or displacement effects. Um, and we can also um, you know, control the image contents or vary the contents while keeping the, those ratings constant. Um, 
This is an example of the, what this image, when I ran it through a, a visual classifier, Google Vision, creates these uh, categories that's really great for telling us like what's contained in the image. There's sky, eye, tree, sculpture, good so far, but that doesn't have anything to do with the meaning space. So this is another layer of information we can now use where it's, you can see the, the rating of abstractness, interestingness, moderate conceptual complexity, moderate visual complexity, et cetera. Um, happy to go in further detail. If, if I could just finish one last slide of uh, future directions. Um, well, I would love to train a classifier to generate these labels at some, <laughs> some point in time in the future. I don't think I'll have nearly enough data, to, but that's a pie in the sky idea. I think there's a lot of potential implications for the field of AI, looking at semantic relationships, um, ability to identify concepts, not just the objects and images. My pet project is to want to follow up on Garrett Modell's work with machine-mediated remote viewing. And I think that there's some interesting implications for using models like this to inform generative models, generative AI, take transcripts and convert them into images on the fly. Uh, so there's a lot of really cool stuff to be done. I'm likely to leave this up here. I would love your participation. If you want to contribute to this work, scan that QR code. It'll take you to ION's website where you can participate in the 20, 20, like short 20, 30 minute version of the survey to help us get some of these ratings. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you guys very much. That was a lot to go through in 20 minutes, sorry. <laughs> Very cool, Damon. Especially Thank since you. you're covering territory that I find personally interesting, okay? <laughs> As someone that likes haunt phenomena and the kind of you know, environmental psychology of spaces and whatnot. But a couple questions. Um, the open access database, will you also give access to the raw data? Because, for example, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, my God, you should be maybe applying item response theory because you can plot person and item reliabilities on the same scale. You also can look for response biases related to things like age and gender. Uh, because even though you're norming scores, you know, response bias always plays a role. It's a question of in what way and to what degree. Uh, and also with item response theory, you can get interval level measurements. So I'd be curious to know what additional ways we could extend this. Yeah, that's the idea. Uh, we're going to release pretty much everything that we have. Um, the uh, one challenge is that we do not have full demographic data for a large portion of the data set because we're, we're pulling from university students, uh, volunteers, and from IONS, and we have two different uh, IRBs that we're working from that have different uh, demographic sheets, so it got a little complicated there. But yes, we will release the raw data, including the data that I've excluded. So um, I'm having to go through a very rigorous process of, of doing qualitative checks on the responses to make sure that people aren't just throwing garbage, which happens a lot. Uh, so I have a lot of filters, quality controls, but so I have the kind of excluded data that people can like play with as well. Also having the raw data, you, see, you can imagine that people relate to the scales differently. And so you can do z-score transformations, et cetera, that kind of normalize and standardize the data into a single space. So there's a lot of cool stuff to be done, but we will give the, the raw yeah. data. Yeah. Any other Damon, questions? Uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I talked to you a little bit about this before. But my re I mean, that you're, you're, you're dealing with the images yeah. Basically, I think there's an interaction between the images and the person. Of course. Who's, who's doing the remote viewing. For instance, it almost gets down to the basics of what did they have for breakfast. So if one of your images is a stack of pancakes and they had pancakes for breakfast, maybe they're more likely to get it versus the person who ate yogurt for breakfast, for instance. Uh, yeah, of course. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, are you planning to try to get a profile of the viewer. Well, okay, so let, let me let me kind of differentiate what we're what we're doing and what can be done. This is not a, an experiment in and of itself. This is a tool set. And so yes, any given experimenter could leverage these tools in any number of ways. Perhaps you as a tasker want to select only highly numinous images. And someone else may say, like, we want to take numinosity out of the equation to the extent possible. Let's minimize those, those scores, right? Someone else says, we want to predict someone's uh, relation. We want to look at that intersection between person and target. So let's find targets that might resonate based on an individual by individual basis. Again, hopefully this is provi providing a platform to which that could be done. But it's very, very difficult for the reason I said about that. You can't encapsulate meaning with information. And even though we have these norms, you know, there's every single person is going to have an idiosyncratic relationship with every single image. 
what we're only able to provide is on average, in the context of a survey, this is like the mean score of whatever, the dynamics, the, how dynamic this image is, et cetera. So, but it does at least give a list, little bit more tangible experimental control than what is typically offered uh, in which it's just kind of like, uh, this is what the experimenter thinks are numinous images, for example. Yes, Amans, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, real quick. Yeah. Um, this is kind of related. Yeah. I'm interested. Um, so I, this seems like a very analytical evaluation of the images. Is there any tension between that and RVing supposed to be like a, a right brain, very unanalytical, like you try to set that aside? So it's like, if you had people score your images intuitively, like you know, a very short amount of time, they don't, they can't think about it. They just have to react. Um, are you going to get better hits if that's the goal um, for the RV research? Yeah, that, that's a difficult question. So we have to kind of disentangle the process of rating the images on these dimensions versus the process of trying to view the images in a, in the context of a study or a task. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that, that remains to be seen. But this at least gives you some level of uh, controllability of what you want to select as a tasker. And you can ask empirical questions. That's an empirical question, right? Like perhaps the duration of the viewing or, or how the, the target or how the ta uh, viewer relates, like what the instructions are given, how they're, how they're approaching the task could be a variable. But we're just really concerned, just isolated on the image properties themselves, right? Not the interrelationship between the image and the person or the image person and the, the whole grinder context. Yeah. All right. Let's all thank David. Thank you.